Amen. Well, I'm so glad to see everybody this morning. I'm glad you guys made it out. I know that the uh, weather is uh, a little threatening, and uh, I didn't know how great the crowd was going to be today, but this is good. I'm glad to see you guys, and thank you so much for putting God in His Word first place. Amen? Amen. Are you guys having a good week so far? Amen. Yes. Amen. You're only a few hours into it, so it should be off to a good start, right? Amen. 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 Well, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad to see everyone. I know that we're going to have a great time this morning. We're going to continue our series on the believer's authority. Now, how many of you are learning in this series? And, and you know, tell me the truth about it. You know, are you learning? Are you getting something out of this? Yes. Is it helping you? Absolutely. Amen. I see Brother Stan's hands up. So Brother Stan's hand is up and he doesn't have on his shaded glasses. I know I'm not boring him. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. See, I'm coming for you. Coming for you. It's something about that back row. <laughs> I love you guys, man. I love y'all. It's going to be great. We're going to have a great time today. So let's, let's, let's jump into it. Let's do our Bible confession. We didn't do that last week. We missed it. Let's jump into it this week. And now we're going to get right to work. We have a lot to cover. And I want to make sure that uh, we get you out of here on time and we, uh, we, we go through everything like we need to. Amen? All right. So hold your Bible up. Hold your iPhone, your iPad, whatever you're using to get into the Word of God. And I want you to repeat after me for our visitors. If you're wondering what are we doing. All we're doing is acknowledging what the Word of God is in our lives. That's all, all right? So repeat after me. This is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am, I am what, it says I am. what it says I am. I have, I have what, it says I have. what it says I have. I can do, I can do. what it says I can do. I am a believer, not a doubter. I am a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better after hearing the Word of Faith. Faith comes, Faith comes by hearing, by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing, and hearing the, word the Word of God. Amen. As I said, we're in a series entitled The Believer's Authority, and we're on the, I think it's the sixth session of this, and uh, we're going to move into the next focus of this series, and we're going to literally begin now talking about the supernatural power and authority that we have as believers. Now, so far, all I've tried to do, if you're just coming in and you're just hearing me for the first time, so far, all I've tried to do is lay the groundwork or to establish the truth that God delegated authority to mankind. God, who is all powerful and who has all authority and all power. The church said, amen. amen. He delegated a certain degree of that power and authority to human beings, to yes. mankind. Yes. And so we made the point that, you see, uh, we've heard many times growing up in church, well, God is in control. God is in control. And whatever God wants to do, he will do independent of you. Well, uh, is that so? Or, or is that, you know, we don't want to bring traditions into our way of thinking. We want to know what the word says. Amen. Now, I do believe that God is sovereign. I always need to qualify this and say this from the outset. I do believe God is sovereign. If you're defining sovereignty the way the dictionary does. First, in rank, power, or authority. Mm -hmm. God is numero uno. He is at the top of the food chain. However, what people who believe this are missing is that God delegated authority to human beings. And so when God delegated authority, he limited his own authority because he gave it to you. And so what happens here on the earth is uh, dependent upon what we authorize. Now, I know that that's hard and I know that that goes over. I don't expect people to jump out of their chairs and shout because, see, you haven't been taught that. Right. See, you've been taught that, see, God is just making everything happen. And whatever God wants to happen will happen. And so if there's tornadoes, God, the insurance company tells you that's an act of God. Right. And they'll tell you that, you know, people will tell you, well, God can do whatever he wants to do. Well, God can't lie. God can't just do anything. There are some things God can't do. God can't be bad to you because he is good. God can't hurt you because he is love. Love works no ill to his neighbor. So God can't do that. And God is not behind the stealing, the killing, and the destruction that we see in the earth. God is not behind it. The devil is behind it. It's not God. And so when we if you say if you believe, if you are of the belief that God is just in total control and nothing can happen but what God wills, then you have to blame God for all the people who are who are 
uh, who are being murdered. You have to blame God for all the women who are raped. You have to blame God for all the women who are sex trafficked. You have to blame God for every child who is born no. with a mental disability. You have to blame God right. for all of, the, all of the devastation, all of the things that happen. You have to blame God for it. Yeah. And the church has done a very good job of doing that. If someone dies, they'll stand up and they'll say, let's say it's a young child, an eight-year-old boy. They'll stand up because they want to comfort the family. They'll say, well, God needed this child more than you did. And so God saw fit because he needed to add a flower to his garden. That is an absolute lie. That is an absolute lie. God gave power and authority to us. And we are his body. We are his hands. We are his feet. We are his mouth in the earth. I'm going to show you all this in scripture. And if we don't rise up and do our job, God is limited in what he can do. And I know that you don't believe that. I know that you believe that God has no limits, but I'm going to show you in Scripture where the Bible says he, you can limit God. Amen. All right, so let's jump into this right now. Uh, let's get started. Go to John chapter 8. I hope you're on the edge of your seat. You probably are at this, at this point. Like, what is this? This is heresy. It's not, her it's not heresy. You just stay here and you'll see. Okay. John 8, let's start here. Now, again, as I said, we're moving into our next segment of, the ses of, our, of our series, and we're talking about the supernatural power and authority that we have as believers. Everybody say, as a believer, as a believer. I, have I have supernatural, supernatural. Power, power and authority. And authority. Now, we're going to get you to believe it, and Amen. we're going to get you to stop being so passive. Amen. And sitting back like you're a nobody, like, oh, God, I can do nothing. We are nothing. But, oh, God, we know you can. God is looking at you saying you can do all things through me. I'm your strength. And if you understand who you are and release my power, it'll work for you. Amen. You are more than what the church has told you you are. Amen. You can do more than what the church has told you to do. We make the confession. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I am a believer. I do not doubt this. Amen. The Bible told you you can raise the dead, heal the sick, cast out devils. Jesus told you to do that. But we're sitting back as though we are no one, that we have no power, no authority. Our marriages are falling apart. We're running. We're sick. We're diseased. We're poor. The, uh, the world is going to hell quick by 12 o'clock. And because we have no power and no authority and no display in our lives, there is nothing that provokes them. Your life should be provocative. Amen. Your life should be demonstrative. Right. I'm not talking about provocative in the way where you're enticing people to sin. I'm talking about provocative in the way where you're provoking them to God, right. where they come to you and they say, what is it about you? Why does this happen for you? Your life is different. People around them getting sick, but it doesn't seem to touch you. People, their marriage is going down the drain, but your marriage is flourishing. People are under, uh, on a downturn and you're on an upturn. Amen. And they're wondering, how is this happening for you? And you say, let me come here, baby. Let me show you how. And then you show them what the words say. You've got to know who you are. This playing church has got to stop. Church Amen. today has become an entertainment center. It has become a pep rally. It has become a Broadway show. I guarantee you, if I had more lighting in here and, a, and, and, and more people to help Davida sing, we, they'd be filled all the way to the back. But because we're just showing the word. And that's why Christians are failing. Because Christians today are unintelligent and they do not. And I'm talking about unintelligent with spiritual things. They have educated their, their, their brain, their intellect at the expense of their spirit. And they do not know how to methodically work and cooperate with the laws of God's kingdom. They're frustrated. And so what do you come up with? Well, the preacher tells you God works in mysterious ways because I don't know what to do. I can't figure it out. I don't know how to change your life. I don't know how to pray for you and get you healed. I don't know how to how to change your marriage around. So what do I tell you? God is mysterious or. Whatever God wants to happen will happen. I guess he wanted that for you. And it's a cop out, weak, spineless, sissy preachers that won't rise up and take their place and say, man, let me just get into this, man, because I got to show you this. I got to show before I run you out of here before it even starts. <laughs> All right. Look at this. John eight. John eight. All right, let's start here in verse 31. We're going to read 31 and 32 together. Well, not together. I'll read it to you. 
All right, notice what he says here. He said, then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. So stop right there. Here's the first thing I want you to see. A disciple is someone who believes on Jesus. Can everybody see that? Amen. That's the first thing I want you to see. Say it with me. Say a disciple, a disciple. is a believer. Is a believer. Say a believer. A believer. Is a, is a disciple. Everybody got that? Yeah. Okay, now watch this. Look at verse 30, 32. And you shall know the truth. Talking about his di di uh, disciples or, or believers. And you will know the truth. And this truth that you know will make you free. So here, here's, what I, here's all I want you to get from this. That God has a truth for believers that he wants them to know. Say amen. amen. All right, let me say it another way. God has a truth for disciples because the believer is a disciple. So God has a truth for disciples that he wants them to know. Say amen. amen. Now, if you know this truth as a disciple, then it will make you free. Amen. So wherever the devil is, has you in bondage, if it's in your finances, if it's in your emotions, your mental health, your physical health, your, it doesn't matter where it is. Wherever he has you bound up, do you know that you can be a believer and still be in bondage? Yes. You remember Lazarus, right? Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, right? Remember that? Now, he was dead. Jesus showed up to the graveside. Of course, Martha's crying. Mary's crying. Twin, his twin sisters, you see. And they're crying for their baby brother. Well, Jesus showed up. He told him, he said, roll away the stone. He called Lazarus. He said, come forth. Now, Lazarus came forth. He gave life to him. Would, would everybody agree? Yes. But then what's the next thing Jesus said? Loose him. See, many times we're raised from the dead. In other words, we have newness of life. We put our faith in Jesus and we've been born again. We have, we have passed from death to life. But check this out. We still have grave clothes on. We're still bound. When you get saved, that's Jesus raising you from the dead. But it doesn't stop there. There's a mind renewal process that has to take place. And that's how you get rid of your grave clothes. That old life that still has you bound. That old way of thinking that still has you bound. So the Bible tells you. He says, be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. See, when you get saved, that's not all there is to it. When you get saved, you now have eternal life. But that eternal life doesn't necessarily flow as long as you're bound. Mm. We've got to get those grave clothes off of you. We've got to loose you. And we've got to get that old way of thinking, that old dead way of thinking from you so that now you can start expressing the life you have. You missed a good place to shout. Yeah. <laughs> all, right, uh, all right, so look at this. So John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth. And this truth that you know will make you free. So Jesus has a truth for his disciples that he wants them to know. Would you agree with that? Yes. And what is this truth going to do for you? you it's going to make you free. Where are you in bondage this morning? Amen. Where does the devil have you bound up? Maybe it's in your marriage. Maybe it's in your finances. Living paycheck to paycheck, struggling. Barely getting by. Marriage falling apart. Maybe it's in your mind. Depressed, addicted, low self-esteem, poor self-image, hopelessness. Where does he have you bound today? Well, we're finna loose you. Amen. Amen. You finna find, let me, let me say this way, you're getting ready to find out. <laughs> you're getting ready to find out some truth. And if you can if you can understand the concept of what we're going to share with you, it'll make you free. Amen. Amen? Amen. All right. So what does he want us to know? Here's the truth that Jesus wants his disciples to know. Go to Luke chapter nine. Here's what he wants you to know. Listen to me, that he has given you power and authority. That he has given to you power and authority. It's time out for us coming to God like a beggar. It's time out for us approaching life on the bottom side. It's time out for it. It's time for you to start winning in life. It's time for you to start overcoming. It's time for you to start walking in victory. In every arena of your life, it's time for you to do that. 
It's time for it. Hallelujah. All right, look at this. Luke 9. Here's the truth he wants his disciples to know. Luke 9, look at what Jesus says, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together. Who is this? Jesus, right? Yes. He called his what together? Disciples. How many of them were there? Twelve. You say, well, Ed, I'm not in there. There's only 12 of them. I'm not in that. Well, what did he say before? We just read it. If you believe on me, then are you my what? Disciples. Indeed. So a disciple is anybody who believes. So what he did for the 12, he'll do for you. As long as you what? Believe. A believer is a disciple. A disciple is a believer. When I say disciple, you say believer. Disciple. Believer. Disciple. Believer. When I say believer, you say disciple. Believer. Disciple. Believer. Disciple. So he's talking to you. Amen. This is the believer's authority. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. All right, now watch this. Luke 9, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them, my God, he gave them something. He gave them something. Someone says, well, I wish he'd give me a million dollars. Someone says, I wish he'd give me healing from my body. Someone says, I wish he'd give me a fine looking husband, tall, 6'4", just my kind. <laughs> Honey, you're missing the point. He gave you something better than a husband. He gave you something better than a million dollars. He gave you something better than, he gave you the root to the fruit. He gave you the golden goose that produces the golden egg. Y'all don't hear me in this place. I'm telling you. You got to realize what you have. You have the power and authority to change everything. And we sitting around living on the bottom when we should be at the top, riding on the high places of the earth. Not in heaven. The church has told you in the sweet by and by after a while it'll be okay. But right now, you just suffer in the door. No, 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 no. It's not pie in the sky. It's steak on the plate. Why you wait? Amen. 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 All right, now watch this. Luke 9. So look at this, verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together, and he gave them power and authority. What's authority? The right to use that power. So not only did he equip you, not only did he did he give you power, but he gave you the right yes. to exercise that yes. power at your will, yes. at your discretion. Yes. And what is this power over? Look at this. He gave them power and authority over all devils. Over whatever Satan will try to do. Do you realize that the root of all your problems is the devil? Yes. It's him. It's not God. God is not your problem. Thank you, thank you. It is the devil. And he gave you the power and the authority to deal with the root to all of your problems. You remember when Jesus, uh, he told the disciples, he said, let's go over to the other side, boys. We got to go to Gadara. And over in Gadara there, we find the most demonized man that ever lived. It, the, he had a, it's, uh, the devil. Jesus asked him, he said, what's your name? Mm -hmm. And the devil said, uh, Legion. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a Roman term for Roman soul. That's he had six thousand devils in him. Mm. Our, our, our legion was a quad of six thousand uh, soldiers. Mm. So he had six thousand devils in one man. The most demonized man we've ever seen recorded in the Bible. He had six thousand devils. Now, now, now watch this on the way over to the other side. Can anybody remember what happened? Thank you, Miss Rudine. Let me let some other people ask. I know you know all the answers. <laughs> Miss Rudine, all that. Miss Rudine's leaving the day and going. Let, let me say this. Miss Rudine's going to Africa. She's a missionary. Yes, she is. And she's going to Africa. Yes, she is. And so um, keep Miss Rudine in your prayers. Amen. While she's over there, she'll be back in two or three weeks or so, right? Right, Miss Rudine? We need somebody to get the answers right, so make sure you come on back, all right? <laughs> all right, so, so, so they're heading over there, and the Bible says a storm showed up. A storm showed up. Now, now, what did Jesus do to the storm? The Bible says, you're going to learn something here. The Bible says, he spoke, what did he speak to first? Did he speak to the wind or the waves? <laughs> Don't worry about being wrong. You learn this way. Don't worry about being wrong. What did he speak to first, the wind or the waves? Let me, he let me help you first. Let me help you get a, let me, let me, all right. Let me just ask you, what did he speak to first, wind or waves? Who says wind? Put your hand up. Who says waves? Put your hand up. <laughs> no one's really cooperating. Okay. All right, listen, listen. He spoke to the wind first. Yeah. 
Now, now let me ask you a question. Can you see wind? No. Can you see waves? Yes. So what does the wind speak of? The power. Nope. The unseen realm. What you can't see. Do you know the root of our problems is wind? It's the unseen realm. It, it causes waves. And that's what makes our marriages rocky. That's what makes our finances rocky. We're in a storm, but a storm doesn't happen by itself. A storm is caused by winds. So he spoke first to the unseen realm. He dealt with the spiritual realm first. You can't see the spirit realm. Listen to me. Jesus gave you power and authority over what? The devil. That's the wind. The unseen realm. If you can deal with the unseen realm, you'll have smooth sailing from this point forward. See, we want to deal with the waves, but the waves is just, if you cut the fruit off, it's going to grow back unless you deal with what? The root, the unseen realm. When Jesus cursed the fig tree, what did he speak to first? The, the Bible says he cursed the tree at its what? Root. Can you see roots? Beneath the surface, you can't see it. We see what? Fruit. What we do is we deal with fruit. We're constantly dealing with fruit, but we're not dealing with the root issue. So what happens? The fruit keeps coming back. But Jesus gave you power and authority to deal with the root issues of your life. And who's behind it? Satan. Satan. And you need to start dealing with him. You, today, Christians are humanistic. They believe that everything has a human origin. Everything. Do you know that some of the sicknesses you're dealing with are demonic? They are spiritual. It is not physical. Now, it is physically affecting you. The, wi the waves are moving, but it's because of wind. When Jesus healed people of back problems, the Bible says he, he cast out a spirit. That woman who was bowled over with a back issue for 38 years, he cast a spirit out of her. A woman dealing with a blood issue, one, people dealing with blindness, he cast spirits out. People who had speech impediments, he dealt with spirits. People who were dealing with mental issues, that child. With the epilepsy, he kept, that's uh, 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 affecting the brain, causing a seizure. He dealt with a what? A spirit. Yeah. And today what we're trying to do is medicate everything. Listen to me. You cannot medicate a devil. No. There's not enough pharmaceuticals to deal with the devil. What are you supposed to do? Cast him out. Yeah. Let me tell you something else. A lot of the stuff that happens in our marriage, it is not just natural. It is demonic. And you don't sit down and counsel a devil. You cast him out. Yeah. See, you believe everything is just yeah. humanistic, see? You, you guys believe that everything is just natural and organic. It's, there is a spirit. Yeah, there, is. there is a devil loose. And Jesus gave you power and authority to deal with him. Yeah. And instead of sitting back and telling me the devil is busy, you need to get busy and deal with him. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Now look at this. Luke 9, 1. So he gave them power and authority over all devils and to cure all diseases. And he sent them to go preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. All right. Now I want to say something here. And if I haven't rocked your world, I'm getting ready to do so right now. I want to say something to you. What, what did Jesus tell them to do in verse two? He said them to go preach, number one. And then he said them to do what? What else is the next thing? Heal. And to do what? Heal. And to do what? Heal. Notice what it doesn't say. What's that, Christine? He didn't tell them to go pray for the sick. You can't find Jesus ever telling a, a believer to pray for the sick. The church tells you that. There is a vast difference between praying, oh God, heal this person, and you rising up saying, such as I have, give out to you as Peter did at the gate called beautiful. Rise up and walk. Amen. That takes faith. That takes confidence. There's a vast difference between you shucking your responsibility. Let me say this to you. With authority comes responsibility. Yeah. And the moment Jesus gave you authority, you now have the, the responsibility to obey him. When he told you, he told you to heal the sick. He did not say pray for them. I'm not going to just show you one verse. I'm going to show you multiple verses and examples. You cannot find in the New Testament 
a command from God for, to pray for the sick. You can't find it. If you can find it, I'll give you $1,000. It's not in there. There is no command to pray for the sick. But what we do is we call up a prayer chain. We get 100 people, 200 people. We go on social media. We beg people to pray for my auntie, pray for my mama. And, that, and, and tell me how it works out. He did not tell you to do that. He said to go heal the sick. You're reading your own Bible. I'm not. This is we're reading. He said, go. I give you power and authority, the ability to correct things. I give you power and authority over all sicknesses, over all diseases and over the devil. Now you take this power, use your authority and get them healed. He did not say pray and ask me to do it. He gave you the power and the authority to do it. Now you go and heal them. I'm not saying it's your power. If we were to take a light bulb, put it in your mouth, screw it in, it would not come on. You are not the source of any power. It's not your power. It's been delegated. It is delegated authority and power. It's not your power, but it is under your authority. And if you don't use that power, if you don't exercise your authority, people are not going to get, people are not going to, their lives are going to fall apart if you don't rise up and be his hands and be his feet. Amen. Are you with me? All right, let's keep going because I got plenty more to show you. So he sent them out and he told them to go heal the sick. Now, let's go look at another thing. With this power and this authority, listen to me very closely. When Jesus gave you power and authority, there is nothing now that can hurt you. Nothing. Amen. Nothing. And when the COVID came in, Christians were terrified. Now, I'm respectful. If you lost family members or loved ones in the COVID, I'm respectful of that. Please don't misunderstand me. We had members in our church who got the COVID. We got them healed in 24 hours. I'm respectful if you got that or if, or if you lost a loved one. But listen to me. Christians were terrified of the COVID. Yeah. People with power and authority yeah. over what about this? Don't you understand? Over all disease, I've given you power and authority. And people were terrified of the COVID. Yeah. Terrified if, if, if you get a diagnosis that you have cancer or you have an uncurable disease. He just told you I've given you authority to cure. There is no such thing as an uncurable disease. They just don't know how to do it because they're practicing. But we're, we know what to do. Well, let me say this. Most of us don't know what to do. So what I'm going to teach you next. See, it's one thing to have power and authority. It's another thing to understand how to use it. Like, let me give an example. Do you realize that Adam and Eve could have uh, had electricity? They didn't have to have candlelight. It wasn't up until very recently in the last few hundred, uh, last 100 years that we have electricity. But the whole time we had uh, power. The laws of electricity were here. We could have had light. We didn't have to use candlelight. It, it, Thomas Edison or Tesla, it was really Tesla, they did not invent electricity. Everyone, they didn't create electricity. You do know that, right? What did they learn to do? Listen cooperate with the laws that were already here. Amen. They discovered it. Yes. They discovered how to cooperate with the laws that were already here. The Wright brothers did not create flight. What did they learn to do? In Kitty Hawk, they learned to what? Simply cooperate with the laws that govern lift and flight. So mankind was grounded his whole life until someone crossed the threshold and dared to look up and say, man, we can fly like the birds. I know we can. I might not know how. I might not know exactly what to do. But man, if somebody doesn't take a step and cross this line and say, we don't have to just walk everywhere. We don't have to ride a bike everywhere. We don't have to take a car everywhere. We don't have to take a horse and carriage everywhere. We can get from point A to point. We can get from the East Coast to the West Coast in six hours. And if somebody didn't dare to rise up and say we can do this and then start seeking how to cooperate with these laws, we would still be grounded today. Do you know today you have the power to heal the sick? Today you have the power, you have the power to get well. Deuteronomy 8.18. Today you have the power to see everything in your life turn around. Now you might be living grounded. You might be, gravity might be working in your life right now. It might be override, you might be held bound and grounded. But there's a greater law that can override that law of gravity. There's a greater law that can override that law of sickness, Amen. disease, yeah. poverty. There's a greater law. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And all we have to do is discover how to cooperate with those laws and release God's power in our lives. And you will change your life. 
That's why you come to church. You're not coming to church to be entertained. You're coming to church to learn the mysteries of the kingdom. Amen. You're coming to church to learn how to cooperate with God. Do you understand? Yes. Imagine if a pilot, imagine if you saw a Delta pilot or an American Airlines pilot sitting in his captain's chair praying, oh God, would you please cause us to take off? Oh Lord. I get off the plane. You'd get off. Mm. Oh God, would you please cause us to fly? He can pray and pray and pray all day long. He's not going to fly. No. Why? Because God established laws. That's how you look when you're praying. Oh, God, heal me. He didn't tell you to do that. Oh, God, prosper me. He didn't tell you to do that. You're using prayer when you should be using authority. And when you should be using authority... See, you, you don't you, you're you're doing what God told you not to do. We're using prayer as a place to beg and complain and try to inform poor, misinformed God of our current situations. That is not what prayer is for. Prayer is to check in with headquarters to get wisdom. When Paul prayed for the church in Ephesians, how did he pray? His prayer is recorded in the Bible. If we were to come to you and say, write a prayer that will go in forever in the Bible, it probably sounds something like this. Oh, God, bless us. Bless Susie. Bless her cat. Make sure that everything, that's how you pray. That's wrong. He's already blessed you. He's already put electricity in the earth. You don't need to ask him to give electricity. You need to ask him how to cooperate with the law of electricity. You don't need to ask him, you don't need to ask him to put the law of flight in the earth. It's already here. You need to ask him, how do I fly? When Paul prayed for the church, what did he pray? God, give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Give them wisdom is his prayer. You need to know what you have and how to cooperate with what you have. You can pray. All, imagine if you saw a woman praying all day. Oh, God, give me a child. A married woman. Got to say that nowadays in the church. <laughs> a married woman praying. Oh, God, give me a child. What would you do? You'd look at her like she's crazy. You can pray and pray and ask God for a child all day long, but eventually what do you have to do? Sow a seed. There's only been one virgin birth, and I can guarantee you, you're not going to be the next one. We don't think this way. If you saw a woman sitting there, oh, God, give me a child. Oh, God, give me a child. Now, I'm not saying you can't ask for that, but there has to be a cooperation with the law after you pray. You can ask, oh, God, give me a child, but then there has to be a cooperation with the law. Are you following me? Yeah. And we're doing all kinds of things. We're praying, oh, God, heal me. But the Bible says he sent his word and healed you. Psalm, Psalm, 1, Psalm 102 uh, Psalm 105 verse 20 he sent his word and healed you you're asking God for healing oh God do this but you got no word in you you have more confidence in sickness than you do in health you're more moved by the doctor's report than you are by the word that says no plague will come nigh your dwelling by his stripes you're healed you got no word in your heart if I ask you what are you standing on what scriptures are you standing on you oh well doesn't it say somewhere by his stripes something aren't we healed you have no clue you're going to the doctor three times a week. You're getting your exams. You're doing all these things. You, and I'm not saying not to do that, but what I'm saying is you're inundated with that. But God heals through his word. Yes. Notice, yes. notice even what he says here. He says he sent them to what? Preach the kingdom. Yes. Then heal the sick. Why did he tell them to preach the kingdom? Because faith comes by hearing. And the way we receive from God is by faith. And you can only get faith by hearing the word. So the power of God is governed by faith. If your faith comes by hearing anybody, if you're hearing words from God, you're going to have God's faith. If you're hearing words that come from the world, then you're going to only have faith in what they say. God sends his word and he heals us. Every time Jesus healed, he would preach first. He would give the word first. Because faith comes by hearing. So we want all these things. We're praying. Oh, God, do this. Oh, God, do that. When Jesus described the kingdom of God, how does he describe it? He said it is as a man casting seed into the ground. The word of God is the seed is what he said. And the word has to go into your heart. And you have to let it stay there. And he said it will produce some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. He described four different types of heart conditions. Four different types of men's heart. He described people's heart who is uh, a wayside, which is like a street. And he said the seed fell on their heart like a ground. Like imagine if we put an apple seed 
you know, in this, in this cafeteria, there's apple seeds that always fall on the ground. We don't see any apple trees. Why? Because it's, ground, it's not ground. So he described people's heart as hard. That, you know, you're hearing, you're in church, you're hearing, but it's not getting in. And he said, what happens? Satan comes away and just takes it away from them. Then he described thorny ground. He said, then you have a guy who has, who, who's getting the word, but the cares of this life enter in and what? Choke the word. So he's got too many other things going on, too many other things he's got to tend to, too many other things he's distracted with. It's not that he doesn't love God, it's just that it's not the priority for him. Are you with me? Yeah. And then he described the person, he said, then there's, there's a stony ground where it doesn't go in deep. So a person gets the word, but the word doesn't go deep. It develops a root really quick, the fruit comes up really quick, right. and he says... It withers and dries because there's no what? Depth. So all Satan has to do is blow on you and your tree falls over. And he said, this is the person who comes to church and they're real excited and, and they're, but they can't make it last. So they drop off. I say one thing the wrong way. I do something they don't like. Something happens at church. They drop off. They're offended. But then he described what? Good ground. Good ground. That's where I pray all of us will be. Amen. He described good ground. And he said, this is the person who hears the word, who receives the word. And what does he do? He holds it. Amen. He sticks with it day and night. And he brings forth what? 30, 60, and 100 fold. You might not be at 100 fold right now. None of us are at 100 fold. But you're getting something to happen. You start coming to the Freedom Center. Some things start happening. Your thinking is starting to change. Some things are starting to take place. Then you go from there to 60. And then eventually we're all pushing for the abundance. But see, God's kingdom operates by a seed. By a seed. If you're praying for prosperity and you haven't sown a seed for prosperity, you don't tithe. You don't honor God with the first of your income. You can pray and pray. Don't let me become your enemy because I'm telling you the truth either. You can pray and pray all day long, but until you put a seed in the ground, there can be no fruit. God's system is a seed. You can pray, God, prosper me. That's fine. But at the end of the day, you need to sow a seed. It's seed time and harvest. You need to honor God with the first of your income. You need to be putting God first. You say, well, I have nothing to honor God with. I have no money. That's a lie. You can't live without money. When we leave here today, we're going to go. We're going to go buy food. You, you need food to eat. That costs money. No one's giving it to you for free. Publix doesn't care how bad your condition is. You're putting gas in your car. You're paying for your car. You're paying car insurance. You're going out. You got clothes on your back. You have seed. The problem is you are, you are ignorant of how the kingdom works. And you think God moves in your life independent of you. God has set up systems, law. How is it that the natural realm can function with so much law and order, the sun sets and rises every day. The earth operates on a 24-hour axis. A woman's gestation period is nine months. And the natural realm has so much order, but the spirit realm is just like, you never can tell what God will do. <laughs> but the physical realm came from the spirit realm. The physical realm is a copy of what's going on there. God is a God of order. God is predictable. God is not mysterious. Is not this thing. If God was trying to hide from you, he would not tell you, seek and you'll find. Knock and it'll be open. Ask and you shall receive. He, he would not give you 66 books in the Bible. The Holy Spirit, pastors, teachers, the prophet, the apostle, the evangelist. He wouldn't give you this if he's trying to keep himself in a mystery. God wants you to know more than you want to know. He wants you to learn. He wants you to understand. And we are doing things. The church, the church is, 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 we, we are, we, we are ignorant of how God operates. And so what do you resort to? Well, just pray and beg and hope. What do we even say? Hope and pray. And I'm going to show you how to pray. I'm going to, in this, I'm going to, I know Melissa asked that question at the Bible study. She said, like, how, do, how, do, how am I supposed to pray? I'm going to show you. Amen. You don't beg God when you pray. Amen. 
You don't come to God begging for anything. It's already done. You need to learn. I'm going to teach you that later. It's coming. I, right now, I'm just trying to get you to see that you have power and authority. Amen. Next week, if we, how far? I don't know that we're going to get that far this week. But next week, depending on how far we get, are you learning anything? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. Next week, I'm going to show you, or whenever we're done with this part, I'm going to show you how you use it. How do you use your power and authority? How do you get, how do you exercise your authority? How do you cooperate with the laws that God has established? You need to know that. All right, so let, let's get back here so we can try to cover some ground. Everybody, everybody with me? Yes. All right. Um, now, Luke 9, 1, that's where we were. He gave you power and he gave you authority as a disciple or as a believer. The believer has what? Authority. Supernatural power and supernatural authority. And the church said? Amen. All right, now, with this power and this authority, there is nothing, absolutely nothing that can hurt you. Look at uh, chapter 10. You're already in Luke 9. Look at Luke 10. Flip over one chapter. I mean, yeah, one chapter. I know I'm probably rocking your world and you're thinking, well, do, should I pray tomorrow when I wake up? What should I do? Should I ask God for things? Yes, I'm, I'm going to just keep doing what you're doing and you're going to keep learning. God is helping you. Amen. I'm not telling you not to pray. I'm saying that we use prayer in a way we abuse prayer. We use prayer in a way that God did not design prayer to be used. Amen. But I can't give you my opinion. I got to show you all this. I'm just trying to say it now so you'll be on your seat. And now I got your attention. So when I get there, it's like, oh, that's why he said this. Mm -hmm. Then you see it. I'm never going to say anything to you without proving it to you in the Bible. Everybody that comes here knows that. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm never going to say anything to you without showing you in the scripture, not Jarrell's opinion. But what does the Bible say? OK. All right. But so far, you see, he didn't tell them to pray. Nothing. You said to pray. The leader of the prayer team told you to pray. Your mama maybe told you to pray, but God, so, so far, only thing we see is I give you power, authority. Now go and heal the sick. Can everybody agree with that? We don't see anywhere begging, call, make, making a Facebook post, none of that. None of that, asking these people, forming a prayer chain, none of that. None of that. Can everybody see what I'm saying? None of that. He didn't tell them to do any of that. You have power and authority. What about that? You can change it, but you got to believe it. Amen. All right, look at this, Luke 10. Luke 10, look at verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed another 70. So he had 12. Now he gets him another 70 more. He got a total of 82 now. And, and he gave them the same thing, power and authority. He sent them out two by two before his face into every city where he himself would come. Now look down at verse 9. <clears throat> Excuse me, verse 8. So he gives him this long thing about don't take any clothes or, or a wallet, don't take any food, you know, you go, and, and I'll take care of you, the, you know. And now look at verse 8. And into whatsoever city you enter, and they receive you. We're going to, don't forget that. We're going to learn that because your authority cannot be exercised on a person that's resisting you. Let me say it this way. Your authority ends at the end of your nose. You cannot use your faith for someone else. If they're not in, let me say it this way. It's like a car. Okay. This is really later when I show you how to use your authority, but I'll dabble in it real quick right now. You cannot, like, you can't, okay, let's, okay, let's say salvation. You can't pray and make a person get saved or claim them. A mama can't stand up and say, I'm saved, now my kids are going to be saved. God has no grandchildren. They have to believe on themselves. Now, you can pray to influence your child. I'm going to teach you how to pray for a sinner. I'll show you how to do that. But you can't use your faith to make someone get healed. You can't use your faith to change someone's life. They have to believe it's according to their faith. Every time Jesus healed someone, what did he say? According to your faith, be it unto you. See, you have to believe. 
Now, so notice what he says here. He says, when you go into a place, they have to receive you. So I put it this way. A person, like, let's say I've seen a lot of miracles. I, I, I had a, um, well, let, let's put it this way. If I come into a situation and someone's sick, the first thing that I do is I locate them. I find out where they are in their faith. What are they believing? What do they want? Because their will will outweigh your will anytime. Amen. God respects the will of people. Even God will not override a person's will. Your will is sacred to God. Your authority is sacred to God. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. So I find out where they are. If I know, if, if, I can, if I can get them to trust what I'm showing them in the Bible. Now, their faith may not be strong where mine is, but if I can get them to where, even if they're in neutral, like imagine a car. Mm -hmm. If I put a car in neutral, I can say, hey, brother, stand come with me and we can push it. So I can use my strength on that car as long as it's in what? Neutral. But if that car is in reverse, I don't care how much me and brother Stan push it. We're not moving that car. It's the same with people. So he's, he's telling them, I've given you power and authority, but they have to what? Receive you. They have to, you have to give them, to, they have to have some degree of faith. It doesn't have to be strong. It doesn't have to be great, but they have to be in some position where they let you work. Are you with me? Yes, okay, we'll get into that later with how you use your authority. Now watch this. And he said unto them, and into whatsoever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Now look at this. Here it is again. Verse nine, back to back chapters. He said this with the 12. Now he's saying it with the 80. I say unto you, he's saying this to everybody here today. He's not. How many of you know Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever? Yes. What did he tell them to do? Watch what he tells them to do. Look at this. Heal the sick. Heal the sick that are therein and say unto them, the kingdom of God has come to you. He didn't tell them to pray for the sick. He said, heal them. All right, let's keep reading. Verse. Yeah, go down to verse. I think it's verse 19. Go down to verse 19. 17, go down to verse 17. Let's see what kind of results they got with this power and authority and let's eliminate all of our excuses. Look at this. And the 70 returned with joy. Now, why were they full of joy? Here's what they said. Look at this. Lord, the devil is subject to us through your name. In other words, they got the results. They got the results. They got people healed. And who did they say was behind it? The devil, not God. God doesn't put sickness on anybody. Are you with me? Yeah. So they got the results. They said, even the devil is subject to us through your name. Now watch this. Verse 18. And Jesus said to them, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. In other words, a joke ain't got no power. I saw him fall. I was there. I witnessed it. Now you didn't. You were born in the 80s or the 70s or the 60s. You ain't seen nothing. But I saw the joker fall. I'm telling you right now, he got no power. He got no authority. That's why I've given you power and authority. And he will bow the knee to you every single time as long as you exercise your authority. Amen. As long as you use your authority, he has to obey you. James 4, 7, resist the devil and he will what? Flee from you. It did not say he might flee. If the devil is still busy in your life, as we say all the time in the church, it's because you are not resisting. The moment you resist and exercise your authority, he has to leave. He has no other choice. He has to leave because he has no power and authority. He is a fallen being. Amen. Amen. And we promote and glorify the devil and make him seem like he is something so fine. He is nobody. Jesus called him Beelzebub, which means Lord of the flies. He is an insect. He's like a little ant. All he has is a big mouth. That's it. And he lies. He makes you believe a lie. He gets you to believe things that are not true. He has zero power. Do you believe that? Yes. All right. Now, with this power, oh, look at this. Here's what I want you to see. Verse 18. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Verse 19. Behold, I give unto you what? Power to tread on serpents and scorpions. And what's this power that we have? What, how powerful is it? Look at it. I give you power over all the power of the enemy. 
all, you have power that will outdo his power all the time. There's never a time where he can exercise more power and influence. There's never a time where a sickness can take your life. I don't care if it's stage four cancer. You have power over all of his power. There is, not, there is never a time when the enemy, your enemy, where I can put here sickness, poverty, depression, addictions, alcoholism, divorce. I can put anything here that's an enemy that's resisting your, your, your success. Anything. Your health that's fighting your health, that's fighting your career. Anything here that's an enemy. He says there's nothing that the enemy can do that's more powerful than the power I gave you over him. Nothing. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. I, alcoholism has run in my family, and it's a stronghold for me. You have power over that. Amen. Pastor, you don't understand. You don't understand. You don't understand. It, it, depression runs in my family. You have power over that. Amen. And the day you start exercising your power and authority, notice how the disciples came back? Full of joy. Amen. We're going to turn the frown to a, to a smile. You're going to start enjoying life. Life is much better when you have the enemy on the run instead of, having, instead of him having you on the run. Amen. Putting out fires every week. You put out one fire, he started another fire. Then you try to do this. No, we're going to fireproof the house. Amen. It's time out. I'm telling you. You have power over all the power of the enemy. There is nothing he can do. No sickness, no disease, no financial problem. There is nothing he can do in your marriage that can overcome the power that God gave you. But you have to learn how to use that authority. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Now, one more verse. I want you to go with me to Matthew 10. There's no sickness. There's no disease. There's nothing that can overcome a believer who understands how to give action to the power of God in his life. Amen. That's a big if, because you have to know how to give action to that power. You can have that authority, you can have that power, but if you're ignorant of how to give action to that power, then for all those years that we didn't have electricity, that's how our life is going to look. It's going to be no light. Now, you have the ability to have light, but we're going to still be using candles. Are, are you following my logic? Yes. Okay. We got to get the elect We got to get your house lined with electricity. Instead of walking everywhere, we got to get you to start flying. Hallelujah. Some of you has taken you too long to get where God intended for you to go. Yeah. God had it on His watch. You should have been much further by now. Amen. Much further. He told the children of Israel that I never read this with you, but if you go read it for yourself, Deuteronomy chapter one, I think it's uh, chapter. Uh, I think it's verse two. He says he's. We should probably look at it right now. Hold, 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 your, hold your play. Go to Deuteronomy real quick. Fifth book. Fifth book in the Bible. Fifth book. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Real quick. I never show you this and I always quote it. I want you to see this. <clears throat> All right. Watch this. Let's start in verse one. Hurry up. Genesis quickly. Gen uh, De Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter one. Real quick. Deuteronomy one. All right. When you got it, say I got it. Okay. All right. Watch this. Deuteronomy one. Look at verse one. These be the words which Moses spake unto all Israel on this side of Jordan in the wilderness, in the plain over against the Red Sea between the Red Sea between Paran and Tophel and Laban and Hazaroth and Dishab. Verse two. Look at this. There are there are 11 days journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir unto Kadesh Barnea. You know what Kadesh Barnea? The border of the promised land. You know what Mount Seir is? That's where they came out. The wilderness. It was an 11 day journey to go from where they were into the promises of God. And them jokers spent 40 years and somebody will set up and say, well, that was God's will. That was not God's will. They did not believe. They did not cooperate. Every time God kept saying, I got a land for you flowing with silk and I mean, milk and honey. He kept telling them, I got a land for you. And they would not believe. 
They would not learn. They would not go in. They kept turning back. They kept tucking tail. They kept being passive. And that's what many of us are doing. God is telling you out before you, I have a promised land, a land of abundance. I have a life for you where your marriage is blessed. Your finances are blessed. Your children are blessed. Your body is healthy. I have a plan for your business. I have a plan for you to be the head, not the tail, above only, never beneath. I have a plan for you to succeed and do well in life. And you know what we're doing? we staying around in the, in the wilderness just getting manna Uh, and then complaining complaining about the manna we we there are many there are many of us in here I'm telling you where you have turned an 11 day journey into 40 years and it's not God that's done it you should be further than where you are but because we are not believing and acting on the word And pursuing God, you know, the will of God does not just automatically happen. You have to pursue God. How much more time are you going to waste? How many more days are you going to waste? How much more of your life are you going to keep letting pass you by? Dealing with the same sicknesses, the same problems in your marriage, the same problems in your finances. Been living from paycheck to paycheck your whole life. Mama lived from paycheck to paycheck. Big mama lived from paycheck to paycheck. Now you living from paycheck to paycheck. Dealing with addictions. Alcoholism running through. Granddad had alcoholism. Now you hitting that henny every night. How much more are we going to do that? Daddy was a rolling stone. Now you a rolling stone. He says, it's just in my blood. That's what I've been around. I know that's what you've been around, but it's time to realize that you have the power to change it. Amen. Get from where you are into where God wants you to be. Stop laying around. Stop being passive. Stop being lazy. Are you with me? I want to read to you something God told Joshua real quick. Go to Joshua. That's the next book over in Deuteronomy. It says, I want to get back to the authority. This is a part of it. You got to get angry. You got to get stirred up. That's the only way you see if you can tolerate living barely get on barely get along street. If you can tolerate having just enough, if you can live with that sickness and you say, all I do is take Tylenol for it and it makes me last for 12 hours. If you can deal with that, you'll stay there. But the day you get stirred up and you get tired of your marriage being the way it is, your body being in pain, the day you get tired of living from paycheck to pay, you can't help nobody. You need help all the time. The day you get tired of that, renting from people, making them rich. The day you get tired of paying interest on everything you buy. You know how much money people are making on you on interest? Go look at your, don't even look at your mortgage. It'll make you feel bad. You go look at how much interest you're paying versus the principal you're paying. Go look at what you're paying each year on your principal and look at how much you're putting in that man's pocket. And that's why God told you you'll be a lender, not a borrower. You don't have to borrow. He said you'll never need to take out a loan. You can be so blessed to where you don't have to borrow anything. They come to you. But you got to believe it. And instead of putting money in a sinner's pocket, you can promote the gospel. Get this thing wrapped up and we get out of here. Prosperity with a purpose. Not just being greedy. Prosperity with a purpose. There are people who broke and are very greedy. You don't have, just because a person has something doesn't mean they're greedy. You understand that, right? Yes. Just because a person has something doesn't mean they're greedy or materialistic. There's plenty of people that have nothing and they're greedy. They want more. Are you with me? Yes. In fact, I think people who have less are more greedy than people who have more. Because they're afraid. Exactly. You're, you barely have anything. So if I, I'm, I don't want to let this go because I don't have anything at all. A person with more doesn't think about that. He can be generous. That's where God wants you. Amen. Where you can be a blessing. Yes. Say amen. amen. It's good for you. Yes, it is. Amen. amen. All right, now watch this. J- Joshua 6. No, not 6. I got to always try to find this. Joshua. Yeah, I gotta, I'm going to find this. Hold on. I might not be able to find it. Oh, yeah, here it is. Hold on. Yep, 13. Joshua 13. 
Everybody with me this morning? Amen. All right, Joshua 13. Are you learning? Yes. All right, Joshua 13. Look at this, verse 1. Now Joshua was old and well stricken in years. And the Lord said to him, you are old. Man, you know you're old when God tells you you're old. <laughs> it's one thing for your kids to look at you and say, Mama, you old. When God tells you you're old, boy, you know you old. That's like when the Bible says you're handsome. Man, there are certain people in the Bible that says, like David, was very handsome. It says Joseph. Was, that's why Potiphar's wife wanted him. He was very, very handsome. The Bible says good to look on. And David had them eyes. The Bible says he, he, had, he was ruddy, meaning red. So he was like, we call them today, like black folks, we say like they red bone, you know? <laughs> so he was, he was like, you know, he was like uh, red complected. And he had, the Bible talks about his eyes were real nice. And you know, women love eyes. You know, they love, they love looking into a man, all this stuff. You know what I'm They love all that. <laughs> and so that, them, man, them sisters was coming after David. When the Bible tells you you handsome, you know you some kind of fine. <laughs> you know it. And when you old, you know you old. <laughs> All right, now watch this. Here it goes. It says, now Joshua was old and stricken in years, and the Lord said to him, you are old and stricken in years. Now here's what I want you to see. Look at this. But there remains very much land still to be possessed. Look, at it. it was God who came to Joshua and said, there's a whole bunch more land left that you have not possessed. Go get it. See, you feel like that's you when you feel unsatisfied. You know, God can give you a holy dissatisfaction. When you look at your life and you think it's the devil making you feel depressed, sometimes, see, feel, emotions are like a, uh, emotions are like a signal on a car. Like a, like a, like a, not a signal on a car. The, uh, yeah, like the things in the car. The, yeah, it lets you know, don't get mad at the light. The light's telling you there's, some, there's a problem under the hood. See, your emotions can be a, 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 a warning sign. And God sometimes is the one behind it. When you feel discontented, when you feel dissatisfied and you look over your life and you, you're like, man, I know I should be first. See, God is coming to Joshua saying, there's a whole lot more I have for you and you haven't gone into it. And you're old and you haven't accomplished what I had for you. Get after it. I'm telling you today that there are, there are many of us that there is still much land still in front of you to be possessed. And what was that land? The promised land. There are still what? Promises that you have not seen come to. There are things that God put in your heart when you were a child and you haven't seen those things come to pass and you gave up on them. There are things that God, you know, you check with, a, with someone when they're four years old and you say, you know, a little girl, you say, well, what do you want to be? And she'll tell you everything. An ice cream truck driver, a fireman, a police chief, a president. <laughs> she'll tell you everything she wants to be. You check back with that same four year old girl when she's 40. Well, what's going on? Well, I'm just trying to get my babies through college. What happened? Life. 36 years of life. And life has a way of beating the hope out of you. Life has a way of getting you to pull back on your vision. Life has a way of telling you, you know what? There's a lot out there, but you know what? It's okay. You can pay your mortgage. You have a car. Be, be okay. Be satisfied. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, there's more for you. What we, we are, the way we are living is not the way God intended for us to live. There is more for us. Amen? Amen. And you've got to start using your power and authority to bring this to pass. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right, go back to, uh, real quick, hurry up, we've got to wrap this up. Go back to Matthew 10. Yeah, I do got to rush, though, because then the people won't come back. They'll be like, man, that boy talked forever. Yeah, amen. <laughs> oh, that's true. They're playing in London <laughs> today. Amen. No, I'm not going to do it. I would love to do it. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> you know, I was in, um, I was in, uh, I was out of town the other day. I was out of town the other day. This was two, sun two Saturdays ago, and I was preaching in another uh, city, another state, and I got to um, the air, I got to my gate. I only had like an hour and a half to minister. So I got to my gate and 
they closed the door. Ooh. My flight back here yeah. to Tampa. They, they closed the door. Mm -hmm. They closed that door and they closed the door to the airplane. Oh. Now, FAA rules. Right. Once it's locked, they can't. Yeah. See, some of y'all been late. See, some of y'all been late to your flights. <laughs> I've never been late. No, I believe you, B. Yeah, once they close it, they don't open it. That lady opened it for me. Wow. Whoa. Nothing. I didn't even say anything. I walked right up and she said, you're Jarrell Cummings, aren't you? They've been waiting for you. She had my name. She said, you're Jarrell Cummings. She said, you're Jarrell Cummings, aren't you? I said, yes. She said, I'm not supposed, she said, where have you, she said, I'm not supposed to do this. She said, hurry up right now. She took her keys and she, it's a code they have to put in. She unlocked all the door. I have never seen that happen. And I won't ever run, risk that again. <laughs> she, she told me. She said, don't say anything. She said, I'm going to open this up and you go right in. When I walked in, all the attendants were looking like, how in the world did you get on the plane? I'm like, I'm Jesus, man. I just appear. <laughs> but that's the favor of God. But I was serving him. I was serving him. Yes. See, yes. the favor of God will be there to do your job, yes. to do what God called you to do. Amen. Are you understanding? Yes. Amen. All right. And so walk in that favor. All right. Now watch this. Matthew 10. <clears throat> Matthew 10 and verse. We said Matthew, right? Yes. Matthew All right. 10. Verse one. Right. All right. Watch this. Matthew 10, verse one. And then we're going to go to seven and eight. Now look at this. And when he had called unto him his 12 disciples, he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out. Now, here's what I want you to see. Look at this. And to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Amen. There is no sickness and no disease that you don't have the power and authority to deal with. Are you with me? Now, look at verse seven. And as you go preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Here it is again. This is the third time now. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three, let every word be established. The third time now we see Jesus giving the command. Look at what he says. Heal the sick. It does not say pray for the sick. He said, go and use your power and authority and take authority over that sickness and, and heal that. Get them healed of it. Are you with me? Yes. OK, heal the sick and the lepers. Look at this. Raise the dead. Do you know that you have raising from the dead power at your disposal right now? And we were afraid of the COVID. You have raising from the dead. See, you don't you become desensitized to this stuff. You have the power right now, lying dormant right now. We're going to teach you how to give action to it. But you first have to recognize I got this. Mm -hmm. yeah. If I told you there was a million dollars in your backyard, I guarantee you dig to find it. <laughs> if you had to get a spoon, right. a shovel, right. it don't matter. You would do it. If, I, if you knew that I wasn't lying, see, God cannot lie. That's right. If you knew that what I was telling you was truth and you could verify it, yes. and I told you that there was a million dollars cash money in your ground, Nowadays, a million dollars really not a lot. Let's say five million dollars. If I, if I say five, you're like a million dollars enough to pay one month, one month of, of living for me. I got kids, you know, I'm trying to come through college. A million dollars, nothing. All right, if I said you had five million dollars in your backyard, I don't, you, and, and you knew that it was there. You trusted me. You knew I couldn't lie. You knew it was there. You would do whatever it took to get it. Yes. See, see, you would dig that thing up if you had to. But if you knew it was there, you would hit it yes. right now. Lying dormant on the inside of you is the same power that God used to raise Jesus from the dead. You have resurrection life flowing through you. You have the power to change any circumstance or situation, even if it's dead. If your marriage is dead, if, if a part of your body is non responsive. Someone suffering a stroke and this whole left side is non-responsive. You got the power to correct that. If somebody, if, if your finances, you're, you're in a dead end career, whatever is dead in your life, not just physical, but emotional, what, whatever it is, you have the power to change it. You have life giving power flowing through you right now. Now we got to figure out how we got to dig it out. Amen. Amen. All right. Now. 
Here's what I want to get to, and I'm almost done. Now, here's what I want to say. This is important that you get this. When God tells you to do something, so far I showed you three verses. Three verses, Luke 9, Luke 10, Matthew 10. Three verses where God, don't pay attention to that. That's an alarm for me. <laughs> three verses. Don't pay attention to that. The, the clock stopped working. I don't know what happened to the time. I wish I could get it to work correctly. All right, so, <laughs> so three verses where I showed you that he gave you authority and power and responsibility, right? Yes. Three verses, right? Yes. Now, when God tells you to do something, here's what you got to get. We're going to end. I, just, give me, just give me maybe 10 more minutes. When God tells you to do something, he's not going to do what he told you to do. When God gives you authority to do something, he is not going to do what he gave you the authority and the power to do. Right. Now, you have to get this concept because this is what there are a lot of people who believe. Well, yeah, God may have given me this, but God also. No, listen to me. Yes, God does not do anything without you. When he gave you the authority to do it, that means he limited himself to flowing through you. OK, let me show it to you. Amen. Amen. Go to Mark real quick. Mark 16. Real quick. See, you've got to get this concept. This is, see, you've heard me say things like you don't pray for the sick. You don't pray for God to prosper you. That's the, when you should be taking authority, you're praying for things. Okay. That's wrong. Okay. When God told you to do something, you cannot shuck your responsibility and ask God to do it now. Right. When he told you to do it, you have to rise up and believe yes. that you can do all things through Christ strengthening you. Hallelujah. You have to stand up and take your authority. You can't call back and say, would you do this? <laughs> Are you with me? Yes. I use the analogy. I said, if you put a police officer out there, a law enforcement agent out there, and he's supposed to be dealing with the traffic, the, the flow of traffic, and every single day. Now, the first couple of days, okay, maybe he's calling back in because he doesn't know what to do. But if he does that day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and he keeps calling back to headquarters and saying, listen, I, I, I can't stop the traffic here. They're going to say, we gave you a shield. We gave you a, a jacket. We gave you authority and power to all you got to do is hold your you're not more powerful than the, that 18 wheeler or that car. But you have the authority to stop them. Yes. And all you have to do is stand up and use your authority. If, they, if he keeps calling back, what do you think they're going to do to that cop? We don't need you. You have a job. You are law enforcement. You don't call back to headquarters. That's what we call prayer. You check in with headquarters and make sure you're hearing from headquarters and learn how to do your job more efficiently. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Okay, now watch this. Mark 16. Mark 16, look at verse 15. And he said unto them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that believeth not will be damned. Verse 17. Here, look at this now. And these signs will follow them that what? Believe. How many believers that got in the house? Put, put your hand high. These signs will follow believers. Now watch this. In my name, in other words, with the power and the authority that I gave them, if they'll use it, they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it'll not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. So then, after the Lord, remember I told you now, when he tells you to do something, he's not going to do it. So then, after the Lord spoke to him, he went to heaven and sat down. <laughs> you got it, right, D? He told them, go. Go. Like with your kids, you say, go clean your room, and you sit down. I told you to do something. Yes. Go yes. preach the gospel, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast the devil out, change the world. He went and sat down. Yes. He's still seated today. Yes. Yes. Now watch the next verse. And they obeyed. Yes. They went. They preached, and of course, they did the other stuff too. Now, look at what happens now. See, they went. What happens when you go? Look at this. And the Lord worked with them. The Lord worked how? With. Not independent of. When they went, the power started working. 
if they would have stayed, would that power work? If, when, see, when, when they went and preached, he moved on people to get saved. When they laid hands, he caused the healing to flow in their body. You're not the power source. We're not saying you are. But what we are saying is it is under your authority. You have to go. You have to go. You don't ask God to do what he told you to do. If he told you lay hands on the sick, you lay hands on them, he'll make them recover. If he told you to preach, you open your mouth, you start preaching, and he'll move on to people's heart. You speak to the devil and speak to the mountain, he'll make it move. You can't make it move, only he can, but you got to speak it. Amen. Are you with me? Yes. So when he tells you to do something, he's not going to do what he told you to do. He's not going to do it. And this is the concept that Christians need to understand, yeah. that he put it under your authority. Yeah. You can't sit back and pray for God to do things that he told you to do. We're How many times have we prayed for someone when they've gotten sick or when we've gotten sick and we say, oh, God, heal me? How many of us have done that? Everybody in the house. I don't want to ask this question or I'll ask you. You don't have to answer. But how did it work out for you? I already know. You know why? Because it's not what he told you to do. That's not what he told you to do. He did not tell you to do that. Are you with me? Okay, now, I just want to show you one example of this. To, to Let's just take the preaching of the gospel. How many of you would agree that salvation? I'm just going to give you one example, I promise, and then after this one example, we're done. But... Uh, Actually, before we do, let me just show you something. Go to Ephesians real quick. Yeah. Hold on, real quick. I'm going to end. No one pay attention to Connor, okay? I'm going to end. He's egging me on, but I'm going to end. All right? Let me, yeah, see? See? I'm not paying attention. That's right. Yep, come back out. Curtain call, right? Curtain call, right? All right. Davida's like, yeah, but... This ain't, this ain't the stress center. All right, now watch this. Ephesians 3, look at this, verse 20. All right, watch this. All right, real quick. I just want to read this verse, and then maybe I'll give you the example next week. I don't know. But I, I need you to get this concept. When God, say this with me. When God tells me, when God tells me to, do to do something, he is not going to do what he told me to do. God works with me. God works through me. He does not work without me. Do you believe that? Yes. All right, let me show you a verse. Look at this. Ephesians 3, look at verse 20. Everyone knows this verse. You've probably quoted it many times. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. And most time we stop right there, close the book, run around the church, shout. <laughs> Preacher stands up and he says, now unto him. <laughs> yeah, that, that is able. Yeah. And the church run around. Yeah. That's not what the verse says. I said he's able, yes. Yeah. He's the God of the midnight hour. <laughs> He will make a way when there is no way. All right, that's fine, but that's not what the verse says. Listen now. He says, now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according. The word according means in proportion. According to the power that is working where? In us. Listen to me. If there is no power working in you, let me say it another way, because if you're saved, if you're a believer or if you are a disciple, he gave you the power. Yeah. So you have it. But let me say this way. We don't know. Many times we don't know how to get it to be activated. It's not. Let me put it this way. Working. He doesn't say now according to the power that's in you, because that would be wrong. We all have power. What does he say? According to the power that's what? Active, working. If you are ignorant, let me say this, please hear me. If you are ignorant or lacking knowledge of how to give action to the power of God in you, you limit what God can do. 
Because He only does exceeding abundantly above all that we ask. That's prayer. Notice they're asking, yet nothing's being done. They're praying. They're asking. That's prayer. Nothing's happened yet. Until what? That power starts to what? Work. You have to learn how to get the power of God to work in you. God is able. Yes, God can do anything consistent with his word. God can do it. But he does it how? Through you. And if you do not understand and you think God just works without me, God works sovereignly, independent of me. If you don't understand that God works through you, then you limit what God can do in your life. You will limit God. Do you believe that? Yes. Look at Psalm 78. Psalm 78, real quick. Psalm 78. We've got to get that power working in you now. We've got to learn how to get that power working. Because if we can get that power working, then God is now able. He wasn't able as long as that power was dormant. Amen. But the moment that power starts working, he is now able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you've been praying about, all that you've been thinking about. God can do it, but that power has to start working in you. We've got to learn how to get that power active. You've got to learn how to, let me say it this way, use that power. Are you with me? Yes. All right, Psalm 78. Real quick. Now look at verse 41. 40. No, 41. <laughs> Talking about Israel in the, in the wilderness and not going into the promised land, which is why it took them 40 years. Now look at what they did to God. For all of you who think I'm just making these things up, look at what they did to God. Yea, they turned back. They tempted God. Here's what I want you to see. Look at this. And they limited. You got a King James Bible? Everybody got a King James? Look at it in the King James. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Can you limit God? Yes. You better believe you can. Because God works how? Through you. He told them to go. He sat down. And when they went, he worked through them. If you don't get busy doing or using the power and the authority he gave you, then you are limiting in your life what God can do. Are you with me? Yes. All right, now, what I want to do is ask you a question. Salvation, would everyone agree that salvation is the highest, most important priority, priority to God? Yes. Your eternal security is more important to God than your healing, than your prosperity. I mean, a million years from now, you are not going to care if your marriage ever got worked out. Right. If Frank ever started behaving. <laughs> You're not going to care about that, right? Nope. You don't, you're not going to be even thinking about that, right? You're not going to care about whether you got your fifth flat screen TV a million years from now. No. You're not going to think about that, will you? So would everybody agree that salvation is the number one most important thing to God? Yes. Yes. Okay, now, the principle that I'm going to show you is this. If the highest, most important thing to God, he did nothing without us. Then you got to know, yes, Miss Rudine, then you got to know. Y'all keep Miss Rudine in your prayers. Don't forget, all right? Yes, keep her in your yes. prayers. Then you got to know that if, if he dealt with salvation this way, then you've got to know that when it comes to healing, prosperity, anything you put in there, he handles everything else the same way. In other words, if I can jump 10 feet, then you, you'd be smart to bet that I can jump five feet. Yes. Are you following me? All right, now, I want to give you one example in the Bible. Before we leave, why I got you on the line, I just want to give you one example. And I want to show you in the Bible where it pertains to salvation that God did nothing except he worked through a person. Amen. I have more than one example, but I'm going to show you this one example. Where God is right there in the person's house. An angel. And he tells the he wants the guy to get saved, but he doesn't tell him how to get saved. He doesn't preach the gospel to him. Right. And God knows the gospel. He's the one that created it. 
But yet he would not do anything to that man. Why? Because he told you to go preach. When God tells you to do something, please hear me. It limits what he will now do. And if you don't understand this, this is why Christians have so much problems in their lives, because they're asking God to do for them what he gave you the responsibility to do. And if you can get this small tweak, you're going to see things change. Amen. Now, do you want to see the example today or do you want to come back next Sunday and see the example? Next All right. Sunday. Next Sunday. All right. How many say next Sunday? Put your hand up. How many say this Sunday? Put your hand up. Sorry. All right, I think that it outweighed the people who wanted to see it this Sunday, outweighed the people who didn't want to see it. No? <laughs> yep, all right. Okay. Huh? I'll show you next week. I'll show you next week. Did you learn? Okay. I'm not going to forget. How is recap? Exactly. Are you going to see you learn? You learn. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, Pastor, this is an 11 day journey. We've done been on this 40. All right. OK, listen. So y'all, man, I never had a church tell me that they, y'all like, man, we want to wait till next week. All right. OK. All right. All right. Don't worry. OK. Now, I, I, I'll show you next week. But I want to prove, I want you to see this in the Bible, because if you see this, then it's like, man, if God handles salvation, I'm going to show you two examples oh, yeah. next week. Yeah. Okay. Two. I'm going to show you two examples in the Bible where the angel, God is in this man's living room. And the guy wants to be saved. And he says, what do I do? And God says, send for Peter. Didn't God know how to get saved? Yes. Didn't God know how to preach the gospel? Absolutely. Why didn't he do it? Because, because he told you to go. Absolutely. And when God tells you to do something, it limits what he will now do. You cannot pray and ask God to heal the sick when he told you to do it. You cannot pray and ask God to save a person when he told you to go and preach to them. What you can do is ask for their heart to respond. Yes. You can ask for situations to be manipulate that the, the God can influence things. You can pray for that. You can pray for God to send a person across their path, but you can't just say, Oh God, save my, my daughter. Amen. Or, Oh God, heal sister. So-and-so you can't do that because he gave you what authority. He put it under your authority and responsibility. And you now the church now has to start rising up and taking their place. I'm done. Did you learn this morning? Yes. Are you sure? Yes. yes. Yeah, that's true. I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm done. Let's take, let's get ready to receive the Lord's Supper.